Um, dear all, welcome to the Forum on Robotics and Control Engineering, or shortly FORCE. Um, I am Tansel Yuselun uh, from University of South Florida. I am an assistant professor here, and I am also directing the uh, Laboratory for Autonomy, Control, Information and Systems, or shortly LACES. Um, with the support from my university, I am very proud today to host Dr. Murat Arjak from UC Berkeley to participate in our live sem seminar series on control systems through the FORCE. Um, FORCE is dedicated to provide uh, free, high-quality outreach events and online seminars to reach broader robotics and control engineering communities around the globe. And to support our mission, we periodically invite distinguished lecturers like uh, Dr. Ajak. And uh, I am pleased to mention that starting from next week, we are also going to include uh, successful PhD students from different countries. Um, so VR Force tries to you know, connect academicians, uh, students, and government industry researchers, practitioners with each other through cross-cutting research and education discussion. Um, before I uh, start introducing Dr. Arjak, I would like to say a couple of words about the WebEx. Uh, during the presentation, uh, we are all muted, and please ask questions after the presentation, and you can do this by uh, in two ways. One, you can virtually raise your hands through the WebEx, or you can simply unmute yourselves, or of course, you can uh, send a text, uh, you, you can directly message me from the uh, right uh, corner of the WebEx, then I can read your questions to Dr. Arjak as well. So I am very proud today, once again, to have uh, Dr. Murat Arjak. He's a professor at UC Berkeley in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences Department. He received the Becker of Science degree from Boğaziçi University, Istanbul, Turkey, and Master of Science and PhD degrees from the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. His research is in large-scale control problems involving interconnected systems and complex performance requirements with applications to traffic control for smart, smart cities and modeling and control for biology. He received a career award from the NSF in 2003, uh, Donald P. Ackman award from the uh, A square, C square in 2006, control systems the <coughs> Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, and Antonio Roberti Young Researcher Prize from the I3D Control System Society in 2014. And he's a member of SIAM and fellow of IFAC and I3D. So for all of you who are here live for the presentation of him, first, I would like to thank one more time Murat for participating in our forum. And Murat, uh, we are ready whenever you are ready for, for your talk. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Tansel, for the invitation. And thanks to everybody else who is joining. So I hope you can see everything fine and hear me fine. Yes. It's perfect. Yes. Okay. So I'll talk about interval reachability analysis today and you'll hear in a second what this is all about. Um, hmm. I advance. Uh -oh. Having a little issue here. Okay. Perfect. So what is interval reachability analysis? So the goal in reachability analysis is to bound the trajectories of a dynamical system with appropriate sets. So starting with a set of initial conditions, at least in the forward reachability problem, you want to know where the set of initial conditions can translate to with the flow of the dynamical system. So in practice, for nonlinear systems, it's next to impossible to exactly characterize the forward reachable set. Instead, people find appropriate set representations and try to find outer or inner approximations depending on the application of the reachable set. So for the types of applications that I'm interested in, outer approximations are more appropriate. So in this talk, I'm going to restrict myself to that. In addition, we'll be using hyper rectangles or simply boxes in the state space to over approximate uh, um, reachable sets. So why are we interested in this? There are several uses of this. Uh, for one thing, you know, increasingly people are using finite state models to represent continuous state systems. And the objective in that is to be able to uh, use some methods from formal uh, methods for synthesis and verification of uh, control algorithms. 
those methods are applicable to discrete state, finite discrete state systems, whereas in control theory, we typically deal with continuous state systems uh, that come from um, you know, physical models. So the one purpose here is to bridge the gap between these two approaches. The second goal is even if you're not interested in that kind of approach, um, you may be interested in knowing how far your trajectories may deviate from a nominal when your parameters vary. So we can treat this also as a reachability problem because we can simply treat the parameters as if they are states, except that their dynamical model would say their derivative is zero, right? So you can include it in the state model. And with that approach, the reachable set would then tell you uh, the amount of deviation from the nominal trajectory when the parameters change. And parametric uncertainty is, of course, very common in practice. So why do we use boxes? Uh, one of the, the reasons I said we are interested in reachability is finite abstractions. And usually in finite abstractions, people use grid structures in state space to define discrete states. So then boxes are quite relevant for that representation. And um, the other reason is that, you know, one of the big shortcomings of reachability analysis methods in the literature is that the, the existing results don't scale well. With these box representations, these bonding box representations, we are able to achieve very high levels of scalability. And you'll see in examples how far we can go towards the end of this talk. Okay, so the most important takeaway from this slide is we have an initial interval of states. It's a um, hyper rectangle, it's a Cartesian product of intervals, if you want, um, where the lower corner is, is x underscore and the upper corner is x over bar. And we want the green shaded area is the exact reachable set, which we will never know what it is because it's, it's computationally intractable to find it exactly. So we want to auto approximate it with a box. And of course, we want this to be as tight as possible so that the conservatism is reduced. So now we're going to the next slide. So just a few more words about the finite abstraction work that uh, motivates this study. So in finite abstractions, we take the continuous state space, break it into uh, boxes. That's the most typical way to break, to generate discrete states. So each box becomes a discrete state. So now to generate a finite <coughs> model, we want to know what transitions are possible from a given box that is a given discrete state under each possible control. So how do I know that? How do I know what transitions can be generated? So that's where reachability comes into play. If I know the reachable set from this gray shaded box under a given control, then those other boxes that it overlaps with, I would declare them to be um, the states that I can reach in my finite state model. So once we get a finite state model with this approach, we can then use control synthesis techniques um, and the, from formal methods. And the advantage of that is that, um, you know, in control theory, we typically deal with stabilization or tracking types of problems. But with these formal methods that come from software verification, you can deal with much more complex objectives, um, such as those that you can express in temporal logic, or if you want to go lower, uh, you can exp express in terms of automata. Um, there have been recent applications of this approach in mobile robotics, aircraft power systems, and vehicle traffic control. So it's an increasingly popular approach. And what you see at the bottom is a schematic showing how the design flow works. First, you start with the continuous dynamics. You abstract into a discrete uh, state model, do the synthesis by leveraging formal methods, and then refine back to continuous state so you get a controller to satisfy complex specifications. So I'm not going to talk much more about abstractions here, but the important step of reachability analysis in the abstraction will be my focus. And abstractions simply motivate the bonding boxes that we use. All right, so what I'm going to talk about is efficient and scalable reachable set computations using Cartesian products of intervals, which I will simply call boxes. 
And the underlying tools are basically nonlinear systems tools. So things like monotone dynamics or, you know, sensitivity to initial conditions and parameters. And also we'll use a little bit of contraction theory, not at a very uh, complex level. And in addition, I'm going to also go through very briefly about a data-driven approach that we started using recently. So the outline, first I'll talk about monotonicity approaches to interval reachability analysis. And then I'll go into a sample data implementation of that. Um, and there, an important technical problem will be getting sensitivity bounds. And I'll tell you how we deal with this problem. And then I'll tell you about the data-driven approach, more specifically a Monte Carlo procedure. And for that, you will not get formal guarantees of um, encompassing the actual reachable set, only probabilistic guarantees. So I'll talk about an example of a probabilistic guarantee you can get and the corresponding sample complexity, how many samples you need to reach a certain level of accuracy and confidence. Then I'll talk about contraction growth bounds around sample trajectories, which is an alternative approach to the, to the ones I mentioned before. And throughout the talk, you'll see examples on vehicle traffic flow and control of an exoskeleton. Those are, this is that will not go in the order that is shown in the outline. It will be interspersed. All right, next slide. Before I go further, I want to acknowledge several people who did all this work. Um, Sam Coogan was one of the graduate students um, some years ago who started this line of work. Um, he was instrumental in introducing the monotonicity approaches. He's now an assistant professor at Georgia Tech. Others have followed. Uh, Pierre-Jean Mayer is a uh, postdoc. Alex Davenport is a third year graduate student. And John Maidens did the work on contraction for reachability. He has graduated and decided to go to industry doing machine learning, of course. And I'd like to also acknowledge support from National Science Foundation, Air Force, Office of Scientific Research, and Office of Naval Research. Next slide gives a very brief introduction to what a monotone or mixed monotone dynamical system is. So let's start with the simple case of monotonicity. So we have a discrete time system. It's basically an update map on the state X. So the big F you see there maps Rn to Rn, tells us where the state goes to at the next instant. So we call that system monotone if the map F is order preserving with respect to an appropriate partial order. What that means is if with respect to the partial order, I have a vector x1 that's less than another vector x2, then the image of that vector x1 will be less than the image of the vector x2. So that's the order preserving property. Uh, to keep this talk simpler, we'll just take the standard order, which means that when I say vector x1 is less than vector x2, that means element-wise, every element in x1 is less than or equal to the corresponding element in x2. Okay? It can be generalized, um, but we are not going to do that for this talk at least. So Mixed monotonicity is a broader concept that encompasses monotonicity as a special case and does not necessarily boil down to monotonicity with respect to some partial order. Okay, so it really is quite different from monotonicity in, in a sense. Um, so what we call a system, again, a discrete time system that you see at the top, um, mixed monotone, if we can now, if we can basically embed it in a in a, in a system that whose, whose dimension is twice as much. So essentially what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to find the function lower x that has twice as many arguments, okay? Two vectors will be the arguments, size, uh, of size n. So we expect two, three things from this function for to be able to call a system mixed monotone. First, when those two sets of arguments, x and y, match, so when you look at little f, x, and x, right, you're going, you need to recover uh, the actual update map, big F. And the little f needs to be increasing with respect to its first argument, x1 and x2, and it needs to be decreasing with respect to the second argument, okay? So this notion was introduced in the 90s. 
uh, the goal was to embed a discrete time system that is not necessarily monotone in a bigger uh, dimensional system with twice as many states and to recover the actual system on the diagonal of that bigger system. Okay, so people then want to reach some of the conclusions they could reach for monotone systems, but of course weaker ones because the mixed monotone system is not necessarily the monotone itself. So that is a quick review of what exists in the literature, but for our purposes, we are interested in bringing these tools to reachability analysis. So in a picture, on the next slide, you see why these are relevant for reachability analysis and why they make reachability analysis so simple and scalable. So if I want to see the image of an interval, a box with lower corner X underscore and upper corner X bar, by monotonicity, the actual reachable set will be sandwiched between the images of these two corners because of simply because of the order preserving property. The actual reachable set may look like the the darker shaded region in the plot. But what we are finding is a box whose corners are the images of the corners of the initial set. And that is the, in fact, the tightest bounding box that includes the reachable set that we don't know. So we use that as an outer approximation. And it's very simple to calculate because you only need two function evaluations. So this was introduced in a paper by Moore and Reich in 2002. Now the mixed monotone case is somewhat similar, but gives us a lot more flexibility in applying this. Um, if you have a mixed monotone system, the image is again sandwiched between two corners. What you do is you evaluate this decomposition function little f at the extreme points where the first argument is the lowest possible and the second argument is the highest possible, that will make little f as small as possible, and vice versa for the upper corner. And under certain conditions, this again is the tightest bounding box for the exact reachable set that we do not know. Right? So why do we need mixed monotonicity? I'll go back to the previous slide to make one comment. Um, actually, I will not. Okay, I'll stay where I am. So I think it's best to understand uh, the use of mixed monotonicity through a necessary and sufficient condition of monotonicity itself that shows how restricted it can be. And that is the following. So if you look at the Jacobian matrix of the update map F, which is an N by N matrix, if you want monotonicity with respect to the standard orton, that means every entry in this matrix needs, needs to be non-negative for all X. So monotonicity is a useful property. You can get a lot of interesting dynamical system properties, convergence, etc. But the downside is that it is, as you can see from this condition, somewhat restrictive. There are situations where it's applicable and it's been used extensively in those situations. So next, I'm going to show you some sufficient conditions for mixed monotonicity, which will make you appreciate why this is a lot more broadly applicable. So one sufficient condition is when you have a sign stable Jacobian. What I mean by that is when I look at the entries of the Jacobian, they of course depend on X. I don't need them all to be non-negative. All I want from them is that they have a fixed sign, either positive or negative, but they don't change as I change X across the state space. That's why I mean why I call it a sign stable Jacobian. So if you have this property, the decomposition function that I was alluding to in the definition of mixed monotonicity can be defined as you see at the bottom line, where you basically take the i to define the ith entry of the little f, you look at the ith entry of big F and go through the arguments one by one. Ask yourself, well, is it increasing in this argument or is it decreasing? If it's increasing, you leave it alone. You just call it, you know, keep it as x. And if a particular entry of z um, if fi is decreasing in a particular entry of z, then you switch that variable z with y. Okay, so basically you take uh, tear apart the increasing parts of the function and the decreasing parts. 
when fi depends decreasing the owner variable you call that variable y that way you uh, generated your decomposition function so you can see that any linear system is mixed monotone because the jacobian is constant for a linear system it doesn't even change with x therefore each entry has a fixed sign that can't change so that shows you the generality we have achieved if you map monotons to two linear systems it still remains somewhat restrictive in fact we can come up with less restrictive sufficient conditions for mixed monotonicity that broaden its applicability for example if instead of having a sign stable jacobian if the jacobian is such that it becomes sign stable after you add a constant matrix k then you can still do a similar trick and define a decomposition function as is done at the bottom of this slide so the idea here is that the jacobian a certain idea of a jacobian may not be strictly positive or strictly negative it might in fact just have a upper bound or a lower bound if you have an upper bound you can add a constant to it to increase it push it up so that it is positive all right or if you have an upper bound you can subtract something from it to make sure that it's always negative so that's what this k does this the way that you would construct this k is essentially by adding uh, by increasing by a lower bound or decreasing by an upper bound to make it sign stable so that means the moment i have a system whose jacobian matrix has has for each entry an upper bound or no lower bound i can i will have mixed monotonicity so here's an example that illustrates um, the usefulness of mixed monotonicity um, and we use this extensively for reachability analysis and formal synthesis control synthesis for traffic networks so this is a macroscopic flow model for vehicle traffic so if you look at the boxed set of equations the, the equation at the top is basically telling you uh, how the density on each link of the network, the flow network, evolves. It's basically a mass conservation law. The density, density in this literature means how many vehicles are at a given link. So the number of vehicles at the next time instant is what it was before plus what came in minus what came out. Okay, very simple. We need to understand though what came, how we define what came out and what came in. So the inflow is basically a depends is a sum of the outflows of upstream links, which is natural. What is flowing from upstream into our link is going to be the inflow of that link. Of course, not every vehicle from upstream is going to flow into a given link. There may be other roads they take. So we have a turn ratio that tells us what fraction of vehicles from an, up, from an upstream link will actually flow into our link. So that way we create a weighted sum of outflows and that becomes the inflow. So that leaves us with the definition of the outflow. That's the most critical thing in this model. So in uh, traffic literature, we'll use demand and supply functions for links. Demand, basically, if you look at the right top, uh, figure it gives you an illustration of what demand and supply might look like demand is basically the amount the number of vehicles per unit time that would want to flow out if there was no congestion downstream if there was no limit downstream okay so naturally it increases with the number of vehicles it's an increasing function it also saturates because you know after a certain number of vehicles on a link then you can't flow anymore you'll be restricted by the geometry of the road and other constraints supply means how many vehicles can i take in given the current density on this link and naturally that's a decreasing function because if the current link is full you can take in fewer vehicles in fact there comes a jam density at which point there's no room for any other vehicle so the supply function goes to zero so the demand and supply functions help us define the outflow. So basically, the outflow is the minimum of the demand, what would normally flow out if there was no congestion downstream, and the available supply downstream. Okay, So that's a common uh, way to define 
the traffic flow model. It's called the cell transmission model. Um, so of course we have some control here too. We have the traffic lights. So with, uh, we can set the flow equal to zero with the red light and to equal to one with the green light. So if you look at this model, uh, whatever you take for the control, uh, you can look at its um, monotonicity properties. You will see that in general, it's not monotone. Basically, whenever you have diverges, that that uh, destroys the monotonicity property you may want. But mixed monotonicity pretty much comes for free. And in fact, we satisfy the simplest case of the sufficient conditions where we did not need to use lower or upper bounds. Basically, the Jacobian is sign stable as it is. So k equal to zero on the previous slide will work. So that's basically showing the mixed monotonicity property in this example. But for traffic flow models, we use this mixed monotonicity a lot to actually design uh, signal timing schemes to satisfy uh, formal specifications. And we've given a, lot, given a lot of details of this in a tutorial paper that I want to attract your attention to. It was published in IEEE Control Systems magazine two years ago. It gives a nice uh, survey of these traffic flow models how we do finite abstractions and how formal synthesis works. And there are sidebars in this, in this paper that also explain some of the underlying methods from formal methods and reachability analysis and so on. Next slide is about, so far we talked about discrete time models. So what if we are interested in finding reachable sets for continuous time uh, models described by differential equations? So an equation like the one you see at the top. I'm going, going to drop inputs, not that they, we can't deal with them. We can, of course, deal with them, but to, to simplify the presentation. So let's just assume a system that evolves by itself. So if I somehow knew the solution map of this, so starting with initial condition X, if I knew where I would land T seconds later, then basically that means I have a discrete, you know, exact discrete time model for this continuous state model, an exact discretization, okay? If I had that, then I just could go back to the previous slides and apply everything I dis discussed there for discrete time models. So then there would be no problem to solve here, right? So that would be the ideal case, but of course, we don't know the exact solution. That's why we're doing these reachable set analysis in the first place. So the question is, when we don't know the solution map FT, nor is Jacobian, and remember those are the two pieces of information that we use in our discrete time reachability analysis, what can we do? Well, one idea is the following. We can numerically evaluate them by integrating the differential equation. So I can select the sample point X, integrate the differential equation from time zero to T, and that will give me the evaluation of the solution map FT at that point X. In addition, if you look at standard books on nonlinear systems, Hale or Khalil or whatever you can pick, you'll see discussions about sensitivity to initial conditions and parameters. So sensitivity equations tell you basically how sensitive the solution is to the initial condition. And you can generate the sensitivity matrix S by integrating a linear time varying differential equation as you see in the block diagram below. That basically uses the Jacobian of the vector field, it evaluates it over the trajectory starting with the identity matrix and whatever that reaches at the end of the time interval is the Jacobian of the solution map. That is how sensitive it is to the initial conditions. So our idea is to, to use an oracle, a, high fidelity differential equation integrator to determine for a given point uh, the solution map FT and the Jacobian JT and then be able to apply the discrete time results I presented earlier. Now, there is a little problem here. So the monotonicity methods we discussed use only two evaluations of FT or a decomposition function derived from FT. So that's no problem. I can do it with, by taking two samples. The problem is to determine mixed monotonicity in the first place, remember we needed bounds on the Jacobian. So for example, we might need, need to know that it's uh, sign stable, or if we don't know that, we may need lower or upper bounds on each entry so that we can add a K, constant matrix K, to make it 
uh, science table. That amounts to knowing the bonds on the entries of the Jacobian. Now, you're not going to know a bond that works for all X um, set in a set in a box of initial conditions when you, you can only evaluate it at the given point, right? So that's the problem. So how do we come up with bonds on the Jacobian when we can only use samples? So, so recently we've developed three approaches to address this problem. So how do we bond the sensitivity matrix? So the first one is um, slightly conservative, but it gives us a gives us a solid bound, a formal bound on the Jacobian matrix. So we just noticed that the sensitivity model in the previous equation is a linear time varying system. So it's continuous time. In general, F fine if you also have parameters, but in this case, I did not include them. So um, linear time varying system. So we can use reachability methods for this class, not for understanding reachability of, of the nonlinear system we're dealing with, just to understand how much the sensitivity matrix can grow to get bounds on the sensitivity matrix. So it's an intermediate step. Um, there are methods for dealing with LTV systems, good ones, including one introduced in the PhD thesis of Matthias Altlaff. So their comp computational complexity is pretty good, manageable, but these results tend to be somewhat conservative. So to reduce conservatism, we propose another approach in this paper seven that I'm citing at the bottom. So here we do a purely sampling approach. We sample initial conditions, integrated science theory equations. And so the problem with this approach, of course, is not it's going to remove conservatism, but it perhaps goes too far in that direction. This does not give us guaranteed bounds because we're just sampling. To come as close as possible to the actual bounds of the Jacobian, we don't just select the initial conditions randomly. We use some falsification procedure. The main idea here is to look for the next sample in an intelligent way in order to, to violate upper and lower bonds that were obtained from the previous samples. So it's no use getting another sample that gives us a bond, gives us a Jacobian that falls within the bounds of the previous sample. So we want to push the boundaries here. So we do this by introducing a cost function of the Jacobian that looks like the orange plot down here. And that function is positive when it's between the previously established bounds and it's negative when it's outside. So our goal is to minimize this function, therefore encourage the optimization problem to, to enlarge the bounds, to look for the most malicious, so to say, um, samples. That way we hope to come closer to the actual bonds of the Jacobian with finite diminished samples, but again, without any guarantees. A third approach is a chimera of these two. It's a hybrid of these two methods. So we get guaranteed bounds on the sensitivity from the samples. Of course, samples will not give us guaranteed bonds. So what we do is we get growth bonds in between the samples. So this time we're talking about how much a Jacobian can grow between two samples. Jacobian, remember, is obtained from sensitivity. To, so, to obtain a growth bond on the derivative of the Jacobian, we look at the second sensitivity derivative. So it's another LTV system, another equation added on top of the previous ones I've shown. So you can generate the second sensitivity matrix, again, by running an LTV system in parallel to your simulations. So with that, you get growth bonds on the Jacobian, and you have the samples of the Jacobian. So then you, you know how much it can grow in between the samples, so you can actually get guaranteed bounds. So that's the main idea. So that way we can reduce conservatism. We will again be conservative if we only have a handful of samples and use a, because the growth bound for the Jacobian will be rather conservative because for that we use the method from, uh, from method one, the idea from method one, and that is going to give us a conservative bond. So we'll have a conservative bond on the growth of the Jacobian between the samples. But if we sample more closely, more densely, then we can control the conservatism arbitrarily because then we'll get arbitrarily close to the actual bond. So the plot at the bottom compares these three approaches on an example of a unicycle model. So 
again, we are not doing reachability analysis for the system here. We're just trying to find bounds on the Jacobian. So the red dashed box shows the result of method one, where we use a reachability analysis for the sensitivity equations. The blue box, which is the smallest, is method two. That's the sampling and falsification method I was alluding to. And as you can see in this plot, it goes, it's very, it's not conservative, but it's also not, uh, not sound. It has left some things out. Um, method three, the hybrid approach with different numbers of samples. When we only take one sample and use the growth bound on the second sensitivity, that's going to be conservative. In fact, we get a, a set that in terms of conservatism, that's not too different from method one. But here we have a way to control the amount of conservatism. If we introduce more samples, then we can uh, get arbitrarily close. And you see that in uh, the purple dotted box and the orange dotted box where we increase the number of samples we're taking. All right, this is how we use sensitivity bounds. And that way we can connect our continuous time methods to the discrete time methods that I already discussed. Let's look at an example. So the goal in this example is not formal synthesis or anything of that sort. We just already have a control. So this is an exoskeleton to help paraplegic patients stand up. Uh, so we have a three link model for it. And so we have controllers designed the more traditional way, um, you know, so there is no formal synthesis for the control. What we're interested in understanding is how robust our controller is to parametric uncertainty, which there is a lot of. So we have a model for the system, a three link model with six state variables and 12 uncertain parameters that can change from patient to patient. And also for a patient from day to day, including your mass, right? So you may eat too much one day, so you'll weigh differently. Um, so we want to understand how robust the nominal control is. In fact, we use this as a control tuning method. Uh, we had a pool of candidates for controllers with different control coefficients. And we selected those coefficients, control coefficients, that gave us the most robustness. And robustness we evaluated with the size of the reachable set the interval over approximation of the reachable set around the nominal trajectory. Okay. So we take a hyper rectangle, a box of parameter values. We treat parameters as if they are uh, state variables. So that gives us a 18th order state equation where 12 of the equations say their derivatives are equal to zero. And then we do the analysis I alluded to. We find upper and lower bounds on the Jacobian using method two and then use that for our mixed monoton over approximation of the reachable set. I'm showing you at the plot on the left bottom for the angle of one of the links as a sample. So the blue trajectories are results of extensive simulations with parameters selected from this box. Many of them superimposed, so that's why you don't see them individually. You just see a thick blue line, which is a compendium of all the trajectories. And the red is the bond we get from our reachability analysis, from our interval reachability analysis. The other, so as you can see, it's very tight. Um, you know, if you have experience with reachability analysis, um, you know, this is a pretty good close match. And the other variables that I'm not showing are as good, only I don't have enough space to show them. So we got very good results on this model with this approach. So one of the things that help us succeed with this approach in this example is that we're doing the reachability analysis, say, to find the red, red uh, interval at time, say, 2. Okay, We're doing the reachability analysis all over from 0 to 2. So we're finding the solution map uh, for an interval, of, uh, time interval of 0 to 2 and then doing our Jacobian calculations, Jacobian bonds in that interval. So basically we did this every 10 milliseconds. At the first instant, we integrate from zero to 10 milliseconds at you know, increasing intervals. We do it again from zero to that point. So that way 
the conservatism that is intrinsic to reachability uh, analysis does not propagate. Because if I start with the reachable set from the previous set, that's also that's already conservative, and build on that, then this will grow. So we eliminate that with our approach. So this paper, reachability is a small part of this paper. It's all also about the control development and um, tuning and all that stuff, but it is the reachability part is also reported in this paper that just came out. It's, uh, it's early access. All right, next. So a Monte Carlo approach that's <coughs> very different from the monotonicity approaches that I've been talking about. It's a completely different approach. I'm not going to take too much time on this. It's a fairly new result. Just briefly introduce the idea. So here we don't do any monotonicity approach or anything of that sort. Again, we have a box of initial conditions. And we attach to this box a probability distribution. If you have no clue, so typical application <laughs> when the when we are interested in a box of uncertain parameters. So from previous data you have about your system, you may have a probability distribution of parameters, or if you know nothing, you can take a uniform distribution. This can include the initial states too. So again, parameters are treated as part of the states. So we want to know, um, we want to get, again, a box uh, representation of the reachable set. So what we do is we select samples randomly according to the probability distribution we attach to the initial box. And then see where those trajectories land with simulations. And if I want a box representation of the reachable set, the natural thing to do is to find the smallest possible box in the state space that will inc include all of these samples. And that's illustrated with the pink box in this figure. The yellow region illustrates the actual reachable set that we do not know. Right? So the question is, of course, we can never be fully sure that we covered the whole yellow, yellow set with our pink uh, box. But the question is, how close are we? Can we give a guarantee on this? So that's what the theorem does. Um, it prescribes a certain amount of uh, confidence and accuracy in our representation with these two parameters, epsilon and delta. That's Those are defined by the user. User says, I want to be this confident and this uh, accurate. So given those numbers, the formula you see for M gives us the sample complexity. How many samples would I have to select from the initial set in order to guarantee the following, to make the following guarantee. So how do we measure accuracy? The way we measure accuracy is there is a probability distribution of the final set, right? If I just integrate everything from the initial set, it will translate to a probability distribution for the final set with support that is the exact reachable set, the yellow region. We don't know the support nor the distribution. But what we can do is we can actually evaluate the measure of our pink set relative to this distribution. Okay, so what we are saying is that uh, if I want to be, if I want this measure to be one minus epsilon at least, okay, that means you've le left epsilon percent of the yellow region out then you need to take as many samples as given by this inequality for M, okay? And you will be one minus delta confident in that statement, meaning that if you want to repeat these experiments, again, take samples, take M samples and see where it will land. Uh, one minus delta of the time, you will hit this, um, hit this measure bigger than one minus epsilon. So, here is an example. We're going back to this exoskeleton model. Same thing. We again treat the uncertain parameters as the, as the initial box we're interested in. We attach a probability distribution. And our co sample complexity says we need to reach an accuracy level of 95%. That means taking epsilon 0 0.05. And the confidence level of 0.999, which means delta equal to 0 0.001 we need 2,000 and something samples. That comes from the formula that I showed in the previous theorem. Okay, So the plot shows the uh, 
the evolution of a set of initial conditions for the center of mass of the body. And as you can see, the, the black curve, the black boxes are, are um, outer approximations based on this Monte Carlo approach. And the dots you see, the colored dots, they are the actual, where the actual trajectories land. And you can see how close we get. So the last method, which I'm not going to take too much time on and describe briefly, is an alternative method that makes use of contraction theory to give contraction or growth bonds. So the idea here is we want to find a bond on how much a norm ball can grow or contract around the sample trajectory. So this is applicable to arbitrary norms. But in the special case of infinity norms, of course, that the norm ball is a box. It's a square, hyper square, I guess. And if you use a weighted infinity norm, then it's a rectangle of arbitrary shape. So by using infinity norms, we can encompass the type of interval box representations of reachable sets that I was talking about. But this is more general. You can also deal with other types of norms and the corresponding norm balls. So the question is, if I integrate the solution from the center of a box and see where it lands, I would like to find an outer approximation, of, again, a box of a, of, the similar, of a similar shape of the actual reachable set. So to apply tools from contraction theory for this, we need the notion of a matrix measure. And we're going to apply it to the Jacobian matrix of the differential equation model. So what is a matrix measure? Just like vector norms inducing matrix norms, we have a norm inducing a matrix norm and that inducing, and both, both of them inducing a matrix measure. The definition of the matrix measure is at the bottom. It depends on what norm I'm using and what matrix norm that induces, okay? So using that matrix norm, the limit you see at the bottom is the definition of a matrix norm. Essentially, it's the, it's the derivative of the induced matrix norm in the direction of the matrix A. This definition may take a little while to absorb. You, have to, you may have to take a look and uh, think about it. But what matters for our purposes is, is on the next slide. First of all, one, what matters is an observation that the matrix measure is always less than or equal to the induced matrix norm. That is a simple consequence, if I go back, of the definition, if I apply the uh, triangle inequality on the matrix norm in this definition, you're going to get an upper bound that is the matrix norm of A. That's simple. But the real interest in the matrix measure is that, unlike the matrix norm, it can be negative. It depends on the matrix. So the table below shows us the induced matrix measures for certain types of norms. Uh, we are not going to go through all of them, but since I said our interval representations are consistent with infinity norms, let's look at the very bottom entry in this table. So you see the definition of the infinity norm of the matrix and how the induced infinity norm of the matrix is computed accordingly. And if you look at the expression for the matrix measure induced by the infinity norm, you see that it's very similar to the definition of the norm, but there's a critical difference. To find the matrix norm, we were doing row sums and looking at the largest of them, but we were taking absolute values of the entries and adding that to get the row sums, right? The critical difference in the matrix measure is that you leave the diagonal entry alone. You don't apply an absolute value to it. You apply an absolute value to the off-diagonal entries and do the sum that way. That allows this matrix measure to be negative if there is an appropriate diagonal dominance property. So why is matrix measures relevant to differential equations? Well, here there, the contraction theory that makes that connection. And contraction theory, you have to to understand has a long history. It goes back to the 50s, Lozinski and others. Um, a very accessible tutorial, I would say, also with some new results, is given in a paper by Sontag um, in his Springer volume, in a chapter of his Springer volume for some fast shift, I, I believe, in 2010. 
So this theorem is basically uh, aligned with that presentation there. If I have a differential equation like the one I was talking about before, and if I have a set that bounds the trajectory is large uh, capital X, if you look at the Jacobi of the vector field, and if in that set, the matrix measure of that Jacobian has an upper bound C, then you can claim that two trajectories that stay in that set will satisfy the growth bound that you see at the bottom. Okay, so if they start a certain number, a certain distance apart, that distance will grow or contract according to the sign of the parameter C. C can be negative. That's the beautiful thing about the matrix measures. So it's not like a conservative Lipschitz bound that can that depends on the norm and can only be positive. It can actually be negative. That's why we call it a contraction when C is negative. All right. So that allows us to get actual actual contraction of the initial box. So one small technical detail here is for the proof to go through, you need to know that the line segment connecting the two trajectories always remains in the set X where this Jacobian bound is true. And this will be satisfied, for example, if the set is convex. So here's a procedure we developed that brings this, these observations to reachability analysis. Suppose you take a sample trajectory obtained by a simulation from zero to T, and you have a norm ball of initial conditions of uh, radius r, little r. If you can find a convex set that trajectories are not going to leave, and that can be a very coarse set. In fact, it can be the whole state space if you want. And find a bond, a, a bond on the matrix measure of the Jacobian on that set C. Then you can claim, just as a simple corollary to the previous theorem, that an outer approximation of the reachable set of the initial norm ball is another norm ball whose size is little r times e to the ct. If somehow you had a negative c, a contractive system, that would be actually smaller than the initial norm ball. It can be bigger too. So ideally, you should do some kind of course reachability analysis to find the, the convex set X so that you're evaluating the matrix measure of the Jacobian on a smaller set. Therefore, you're likely to get the smallest C you can. That way, uh, your outer approximation using this contraction method will be as tight as possible. So we developed this idea in a transaction of automatic control paper in 2015. Uh, there are relevant papers, uh, notably by Fan et al. from the Cyan Mitra group um, that was published in MSoft in 2016. Uh, there is also a component-wise variant of this method where you don't have one contraction rate for every state, but element-wise you can have contraction rates for each state. That also has some history. Um, the paper by Reisig et al. in Transactions 2016 uh, uses that variant, but they also give credit to others who've introduced similar results before. So we have a toolbox that we introduced at the last HSCC that combines some of the methods I've been describing to you. Um, it's very user-friendly, or it's supposed to be. So you define your system, and you give the, 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 the time uh, over which you want to do your reachability analysis. And you can select one of the many methods that are appropriate for interval reachability analysis. And if you have no clue, the tool is also able to select an appropriate one for you. And it's also extensible. You can write your own code. It's MATLAB code, open source. So you can add your own favorite method and attach it to the core um, hub, which we call the hub in our uh, MATLAB tool. So, I want to sort of conclude by saying that all of the methods I discussed here are simulation based. So you generate trajectories. Now that also opens the door to major speed ups because you can actually parallelize ODE integration. The reason for the tools that I've been presenting to you, why we've been interested in them in the first place was scalability to be able to 
break the curse of dimensionality and be able to do reachability analysis for large systems. And we've succeeded with various of these simulation-based methods, but there's more to be done. You can use parallelization of the OD integration and achieve major speed ups. So here's an example that I will present without too much detail. It's, uh, it's a submitted paper, but under review. So this is actually using parallelization on top of the, some of the methods that I described to you. So we did this for the component-wise contraction that I was alluding to. We did it for Monte Carlo. We did it also for mixed monotonicity. So this shows a um, benchmark problem. This basically applies them to a benchmark problem, which is the traffic model that I showed to you earlier. But we have a single network of uh, basically a line graph. So a continuous uh, line of links, okay, uh, where the flow on this line, on this long segment of a highway, if you wish, is described by a model similar to the cell transmission model that I was talking about. So it's a nonlinear model. So we apply these tools uh, first without parallelization, and that's what Tira does in its current form. The Tira, the tool I just talked about, is serial. It just serially integrates differential equations and uses the other tools on top of it. So the black curves you see in these two plots are the results of Tira. Once you reach about, you know, about a thousand or ten thousand, depending, uh, states in this benchmark problem, um, things start getting longer. The computations take longer and you reach the hour mark. With parallelization, you can go much farther than that, as you can see from the four um, other curves. So they uh, tell you about the, the, um, the computing units that were used. Um, and basically, those use the OpenCL uh, computing language to parallelize a fourth order Ranga Kata scheme. And you can see how far we can go. We can exceed a billion states. And that's a number that's not commonly seen in reachability analysis. So I will leave it at that, and I'll be happy to take any questions in the remaining couple of minutes. Thank you so much, Murat. It was a great uh, talk. Um, so um, now, uh, again, we, we would like to uh, take questions. Uh, so um, again, uh, there is a chat box. Um, on the VEX, so you can, if you like, you know, since the session is being recorded, if you don't want your voice to be included, you can uh, directly write to me or everyone uh, about your question, and I will be very pleased to read your question to Dr. Arjak. Uh, second option, of course, you can uh, unmute yourself. So sometimes, uh, Murat, in the uh, online, uh, our online uh, attendees sometimes don't prefer asking questions, but, you know, um, as compared to regular, uh, uh -huh. uh, you know, seminars uh, that happened uh, several of times, okay. uh, but in uh, but they would like to send uh, several emails, you know. So happy. Okay. I'm happy to respond to all. Perfect. Um, so, I mean, uh, it was a great talk from our must. Thank you. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Thanks a lot for your time. First webinar, in fact, so I didn't know what to expect, but that's pretty good. It's a little weird not to see the people you're talking to, but it's all right. That, that's that's right. You know, I'll you just assume they're all nodding and happy, and yes, of course, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know, it was integral reachable analysis and. Is, I mean, very interesting emerging works, and thanks for sharing your works with us. Uh, oh, one question from Daniel Silvestre. So, can we get the slides? Can you also comment on the benefits of using this approach in comparison to a prototype uh, polytope based? Sorry. The prototype polytope based? Sorry. Uh, comparison in, in comparison with a poly, polytope based. Oh, okay. I mean, there are many, many approaches, right? So. There are, I mean, one of the, the most powerful ones is the method using zonotops. There's a tool called Cora that does this. Um, you know, each of these tools have their pros and cons. So 
This particular set representation we use may or may not be the best. If you're trying to get very close to the actual reachable set, that bonding box may not be the best one. The way to get around that is to perhaps use smaller boxes. So you can, <coughs> you can if you have an initial set that is not a box, you can uh, cover it with smaller boxes and see where they each land and look at their union. We can do those types of tricks to come closer. But of course, that increases the number of the computations required. Regarding zonotops, you know, Cora is a great tool. Uh, we've tried it on some of the examples we have. Uh, the problem we had was that, you know, there are a lot of parameters to tune in Cora. There are internal uh, parameters for the internal solver, and it's not quite clear how to pick them or optimize them for the application. It's really for the expert who knows all the details of the zonotop. So the, the method, the tool Tira that I told you about is very user friendly. You have nothing to tune. You can say that's not a good thing. I may agree to some degree. Um, also, you don't even need to know which tool you're applying. So basically, you know, the comparison between these methods boil down to the set representation, which is better for your application. Um, in addition, scalability is a problem. If you have only a few states, the chances are one of the methods out there will work for you. Uh, but if you're dealing with hundreds, thousands, millions of states, then um, you may have to uh, use some of these interval approaches. Thanks so much. Uh, I'll be happy to share the uh, slides. Uh, one one more uh, question from uh, Daniel Liberzon. So, uh, Murat, thanks for the lecture. Is there some notion of monotonicity that helps work with over approximation shapes uh, that are, say, Euclidean balls as opposed to the boxes? So, sorry, can you read that again? Of course. So, um, is there a notion of mono monotonicity that helps work with over approximation shapes that are, say, Euclidean balls as opposed to boxes? Oh, that's not monotonicity. No, that's that's contraction, quite distinct from monotonicity. Um, yeah, that can, in that you can use any kind of shape. I mean, any kind of norm ball, uh, but it's very different. So, I mean, there is some high level in between those because they, these are all properties of the sensitivity matrix. So monotonicity is basically a sign to be your boundedness of the sensitivity matrix. Whereas, whereas um, contraction amounts to bond on the size of the, I mean, this, the, the um, matrix measure of the sensitivity matrix, but they are, they have different, there are different types of bonds on the sensitivity. So in that sense, I don't see them completely. I don't see one to be a special case of the other. They are independent types of approaches to bonding the sensitivity. One, you can think of it one as the sign uh, property of the sensitivity. The other is a, as a you know norm bound on the sensitivity or something of that sort. Uh, thanks so much and uh, thanks for that one more time. Again, um, I will share you the link. Uh, we are going to put this to YouTube uh, to make it available to uh, okay, the I'll send you the slides. Uh, perfect. Thanks so much. Again, thanks for your time. Thanks for being today's speaker and it was great uh, to listen. Thank you. All right. Thanks everyone. So we are ending the session next week. Uh, we will now talk about more about adaptive control this time. Thanks.